all hospitals try and reduce stress. But this particular hospital calls on the services of a very special expert to do that. Someone with lots of blonde hair, bad breath and a wet nose. Meet Golden Retriever Nala. She's worked as a pet therapy dog for 14 years and is known at this hospital as Dr Dog. <coughs> Animal therapy dogs like Nala need to be calm, obedient and really intelligent. Not any old mutt can make the cut. Two of Nala's biggest fans are Spike and his sister Poppy. Spike has been in and out of hospital for most of his life. He and Nala have become good friends. What's your favourite bit of Nala to stroke? I've got two. Go for it. My, her ears and her tummy. And her tummy. How does it make you feel when you see Nala? Poppy, how do you feel? Because you come into hospital a lot to see your younger brother. Yeah, I think Nyla helps you relax. Nyla, do you feel happy when you see Spike? Yes! <laughs> Nyla makes new friends every day. Harvey has just popped in for a checkup. While you've been with Nyla, have you been agonising about your appointment? I've just been thinking about the dog, really. <laughs> Dogs are, like, really cuddly and they just look really cute. Once you've petted her, we ask everyone Spray their hands. Nala has a bottle of germ-busting gel attached to her collar. Do you know why that's important? You might get germs if you put your hand in your mouth. So you've got to wash your hands. That is exactly right. There's no doubt that this professional pooch can put a smile on your face, but can Nala really have a physical effect on a patient's health? Well, let's put Dr Dog to the test. To help me, here's Miracle, who's in hospital having kidney dialysis treatment. Can you explain to me how it all works? The machine can clean my blood. So the machine is taking the place of your kidneys, is that right? Mm -hmm. So what I want to do is, while you're having your dialysis, I want to measure your blood pressure. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to bring in Nala the dog mm -hmm. and we're going to see what happens to your blood pressure. Mm -hmm. A blood pressure test is a simple way to check if a patient is stressed. Being stressed out can lead to high blood pressure, which means that your heart is under extra strain. So, Miracle, at the moment, your blood pressure is 116 over 67. Those numbers mean Miracle's blood pressure is already within the normal range. But let's see if Nala can make Miracle even more relaxed. After a few minutes of stroking our happy hound, we take Miracle's blood pressure again. So, Miracle, your, your blood pressure has gone from 116 over 67 to 105 over 59. So, although it's still within the normal range, her blood pressure has gone down, meaning Miracle is more relaxed and less stressed. The science is clear. Not only does Nala make people smile, she also physically improves a patient's health. For me, that is totally amazing that we can bring an animal in and just through affecting Miracle's mood, we can have a really big effect. Now, stress over a long time can be bad for your body, but dogs like Nala are amazing at relieving it. So every single person she's met today, including me, has had a little boost. I feel very relaxed. Thank you, Nala. <laughs> Ever wondered why you have to go to sleep? Ever heard someone snore so loudly the room rumbles? We're about to tell you why. This is a case for investigation ouch. You spend a third of your life doing absolutely nothing. I'd hardly call picking my nose nothing. I'm not talking about your disgusting personal habits. I'm talking about sleep. All animals do it, including us, and it's essential for life. So to find out more about it, we're going to bed. To discover what happens when we sleep, we're spending the night in this special sleep clinic. But first, we need to get wired up by a team of sleep experts. All this equipment will give us information about what our bodies do when we sleep. I suppose you're also going to have your bear wired up. Of course I am. Mr Grumble has a lot of trouble sleeping sometimes. Monitoring us will be sleep expert Dr Wahab Dehamek. So sleep is not just sleep. There are different types of sleep. Absolutely. And some of the types of sleep relax your brain and recharge that, and other types of sleep recharge your body. Basically, yes. And that's why we, that's why we need sleep. Hi, Chris. Hi, Zan. It's time for us to go to sleep. Dr. Waheb sets the computers up to record the night ahead, and I'm hoping this will prove, once and for all, that Zan snores. He's always denied it. Mr. Grumbles knows I never snore. No, Mr. Grumbles. 
In a single night, your brain cycles through different types of sleep every 90 minutes until you get up. You'll start with a light sleep. This lasts around 20 minutes and your breathing and heart rate slow down. You can still be easily woken at this stage. Then you fall into a deeper sleep. It's at this stage where some people walk or talk in their sleep because their body is still active even though their brain is resting. And then you start REM sleep, which stands for rapid eye movement. It's in this stage where your brain is organising itself and you'll have a dream or two. And then your body repeats this sleep cycle about four or five times in a night. Next morning and it's time to get up. Other people say I snore, but I really maintain that I don't. I think they're all liars. All will be revealed shortly, Zan. I didn't sleep very well at all. We're both looking a bit weary. Oh, dear. Let's find out why we're both so tired. Press this line here. That's for when you were awake. And then here you slept. That's different sleep staging. And then here you were awake and then you slept again and then you were awake. So in terms of a good night's sleep, I only had, what, two and a half hours. Although I was in bed for six hours, I only was actually asleep for two and a half, and that is just not enough. And not only does my body feel very tired, my brain feels really thick-headed and unrested as well. So how did mine compare to Chris's? You had more sleep. And how long did I sleep? Four and a half hours. So I got twice as much sleep as you. But even four hours sleep isn't enough for your body to rest, especially when you're young. Children need at least eight hours because you're still growing and your body needs to work harder. Chris and I are adults and we can get away with less, but it still makes us feel very tired. What about dreaming? How do we compare on that? Well, Chris, uh, I don't think you had a dream at all. Xan, you had two. Although I had a full sleep cycle, it was pretty restless and I just didn't dream, which can happen sometimes. But look at this section of the graph. I had lots of rapid eye movements, and this suggests that I was dreaming. How long were the dreams? Are they are they well, short dreams, or? One of them is half an hour, was half an hour. Really? Yes. Half an hour of dreaming? What about snoring? You did snore, Zand. I did? Yeah. OK, Zand, there's the proof. You do snore. Oh, dear. How much of the time was I snoring? 7% of the night. Not everyone snores like me. But people who do snore can't move air freely through their nose or mouth during sleep. So the air vibrates against the relaxed muscles in their throat and nose. And that's what makes that snoring sound. You sleep for a third of your life, but you're not doing nothing while that's going on. You're recharging your brain and you're recharging your body. So if you don't get enough sleep, that's going to affect everything you do. And you'll feel absolutely rubbish. Are you finding it hard to sleep? Finding it even harder to get up? Are your parents constantly having to nag you to either go to bed or wake up in the morning? Let's get up! Well, you come to the right place. This is Dr. Chris's one-stop sleep shop clinic place for all your sleep-related needs. Terms and conditions apply. Monsters under the bed will not be dealt with as a cause of lost sleep. Offer only applies to die-hard operation large fans. Going to bed late and not getting up on time are things we all do occasionally. But if you're hitting puberty, there's actually a scientific explanation. It's not just laziness, or not most of the time. It's all part of becoming an adult. Now, to show you why, I'm going to need some spit and some more sleep. Now, leave me alone. Pots, so take one These pot. volunteers are going to demonstrate how puberty changes how you sleep. Meet Ashley and Emma. They're eight years old, and they're our young sleepers. And this is Thomas, Megan and Alana. They're all 13, they're our teen sleepers. I'm asking them to collect samples of their saliva every hour between 4pm and when they go to bed. So, does everyone understand? Yes. yes. We need to spit in these pots. Yay! The samples our two groups are taking will allow me to monitor levels of a hormone called melatonin. It's 6pm, so I need to spit now. Melatonin is a hormone your body releases to make you fall asleep and get some rest. Good night. I've come to meet neuroscientist Dr. Paul Greengrass. He's been analysing our saliva samples for levels of melatonin. What are the results then, Doc? The younger children 
Dan Melatonin was starting to be produced about 7.30 or 8 o'clock at the latest. So, that's why if you're younger, you get tired around this time, but it changes as you reach puberty. For the teenage group, their melatonin was not even being produced till about 10 or 11. And that's why they don't feel tired until much later on. But you have to be careful because some things can stop the melatonin doing its job. We've actually got a body clock that's sensitive to light. If you start doing things with bright lights, you are managing to switch off your own melatonin, which is one of the problems. So screens like iPads and electronic high-tech stuff have a lovely bright blue light, which keeps us alert. And in the evening, it's about the very worst thing you could do. So the best thing to do before bed is to stay away from computer screens. But because you're going to bed much later than you were before puberty and still having to get up at the same time, that can take some adjusting to. If you yourself are finding it difficult to wake up, well, now you know there's a biological reason for it. You're not just being lazy. Good night. <laughs> This place is super busy and your school is probably no different. People rushing around, places to get to, not enough time to get there and deadlines to meet and I find it can get a bit stressful. And stress in short bursts can be good for you. It gets you through exams or sports matches. But when it builds up and up and it takes over, it can have a big impact on your physical and mental health. We've all experienced stress. That deadline for your coursework, loads to do, time ticking away, but your phone keeps going off. You feel your chest tightening and a rising sense of panic. It's a horrible feeling. So what's actually happening inside your body? Well, adrenaline is being released from your adrenal glands, which makes your heart beat much faster. If this happens every now and then, it's OK. But if it happens again and again over a prolonged period, it's called chronic stress, and this has a serious effect on your health. For starters, it raises your blood pressure, putting a strain on your heart. It suppresses your immune system, so you're more likely to get ill. It changes your metabolism, so you can put on weight and may get problems like heartburn. And of course, it can lead to mental health conditions such as depression and anxiety, which can cause panic attacks. Everyone in their lives will experience probably moments of severe anxiety, and that's the first step on the road to having an attack. So it might look something like this. He's clasping his hands, he's looking around, but there's not a lot of visible external signs that he's really losing control. Zando, how are you feeling inside your own head? So I can feel my, my heart pounding, my chest is getting tighter, my hands are sweating, and all of those things are making me feel worse. At this stage, you may be able to get the panic under control, either by moving to a different place or speak to someone and feel a bit better. But you may not, and that's when the panic can get out of control and become a full-blown panic attack. So as Zand becomes more panicky, his body releases the adrenaline, and those hormones start to make his heart pound, his breathing rate increase. That makes his body feel physically very bad. That, in turn, increases the level of panic, and so Zand gets into a vicious cycle that he is unable to control. Anxiety or panic attacks happen because you've lost control of your breathing. You try to breathe in deeper and more quickly than normal. Overbreathing or hyperventilating causes a decrease in the amount of carbon dioxide in your blood, leaving you with too much oxygen and making you feel dizzy. Hyperventilation can also give you chest pains because it causes blood vessels in your body to constrict. Add to this the fact that the release of adrenaline has made your heart pump out blood faster and you've got sharp stabbing pains that feel like a heart attack. And that makes you panic even more. And that's when someone needs a bit of help. I know you're feeling terrible. Everything's going to be all right. I want you to listen to my voice. Close your mouth. Get your breathing under control, OK? You're going to be all right. Concentrate on something else. Focus on your feet. Close your mouth. Just put your finger on your mouth. And slow your breathing down, OK? You just breathe in and out through your nose. Well, that's good. Now have a seat, OK? That's good. How do you feel now? I actually feel... Mainly I feel very tired. And although I was only pretending to have a panic attack, I can feel my heart rate racing and I do feel quite exhausted. So one of the things that you may have to do for someone who's had a panic attack and is recovering is getting them a glass of water, allowing them a bit of space, getting them to rest, sometimes a cup of tea, 
all those things can really help keep someone calm.